My name is Awiri Obaigbo. I'm the author of The Wretched Billionaire. I want to read a chapter to you. Chapter 1. It was a new year, all right, but there was nothing happy about it. A stray bullet got between her father's eyes and doused the fireworks that used to paint her Christmas sky. It winged the high hopes that used to sweeten these dewy first days of the year. All burial rites were over now, and the bleak reality had come to this and face life. Walking back from the wooden bridge, the stars were shy. The night was black, but for a few fireflies. Our choices were as dark and loathsome. A happy romance with Buddy was part of him. As dropping out of medical school at this stage was not an option. Faith was so engrossed in her sad situation that the car seemed to have cropped out of air. It was quiet and black, betrayed only by its brake lights. Beads of ice sprang from her nape and raced down to her waist. Faith was far from everyone, deep into the fallow path of the campus. Sorrow had brought her to the one place in Liberty University where she was so sure she could be alone. She used to come out here with Ibarim, the boyfriend she now felt obliged to teach. And they never met anyone out here. This car in the wilderness could not be a good omen. Faith glanced around and saw menacing forms and unseen eyes hovering towards her. Her father, a police sergeant, got shot just before Christmas. Faith panicked. Is it my turn to be slaughtered? What will happen to my pregnant mother and my little brother? She thought of running away. She threw her arms in the air. The young woman yielded to the despair which had been a burden for twelve days, during which she wore a brave face over her dim expectations. She sank to her knees and wailed, Kill me! Make it quick. I am tired. Her voice was loud. Tears flushed out her fears. Kill me quickly. Motherers, don't expect me to beg. This had the car door open. She did not bother to raise her face from the cold road. Her nostrils ran freely. She waited, sweating, shivering. The sounds of spike hills tapping on stones pushed. A feminine fragrance mounted the night. Neither sound nor perfume matched her expectation. You will not die, my sister. A sweet voice said. Fear of mermaids fluttered in her guts as she froze. Not tonight, the voice continued. 
The silky touch of the stranger's hair prompted Faith to lift up her face from the asphalt's refuge. Not any time soon, honey. The tall woman was reassuring as she helped Faith to her feet. Am I dreaming? No, honey. Are you an angel? Flesh and blood and bones. Angels never show up. Trust me. Are you setting me up? Is that what you feel? The stranger turned and started walking slowly towards her car. Faith remembered her mother's warning. Evil can wear the mask of the helper to harm the unwary. The tall stranger had opened the door and was about to get into her car when in desperation shoved her fears away. Faith ran after her. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. The stranger paused. Faith ran into her arms and sobbed. It's all right, hon. That's a legitimate fear. I'm so sorry. My name is Faith. Faith Eromosere. 500 level medicine. Are you Admiral Eromosere's daughter? My father was a sergeant in the police force. The Admiral is Victorio. My father was Victor. He was shot 12 days ago. Right in the high court premises. He was assigned to guard the judge. Oh dear, I read it in the paper. The names caught my attention. Very bullet, wasn't it? That's my daddy. He only made the news when he died. Tough luck, honey. But not the end of life, the stranger said. He left my old mother my kid brother and an unburned child of my lap. My father was in the fourth in the army. He died when I was nine. My mother abandoned us when I was three. I never knew her. She left us to pursue music. I don't think she ever caught the rainbow. But she never came back for me. I have no relatives whatsoever that are known to me. None at all. So count your blessings on it. At least you have a mother. Not to mention your father's entitlement. Faith of the bitter not. The sobs surfaced again. My dad had taken a loan with the police cooperative society to build a stupid house on family land in our village. After the deductions, we had barely enough to pay our rent for this year. Oh dear, I drove out here to celebrate my good fortune. You came to cry over your misfortune. Quite ironic, Consider. If I may say, you could be the sister I never had, and I could be an angel who showed up. They drove in silence for a while. As they turned towards the main gate, another wave of fear arose in faith. You did not tell me your name, she said. The stranger laughed. My name's Eve, 400 level law. Eve? Are you the one they call Eve of the Golden Anklet? Guilty. It's a lie. I mean, for real? 
Eve laughed again. I had a roommate we nicknamed Chronicles because of you. She always had a story about you and had every magazine featuring you. But no magazine ever confirmed you were here. And here you are. Unbelievable. Eve of the golden anklet. She was silent for a long while. Faith grew more comfortable in that time. By the rays of the street lamps falling on and off her face as she drove on, Eve had a captivating face. Her laughter sounded somehow like joyful music. Is it true you are well over 40? Faith asked. Forget all you ever heard about me if you want us to be friends. Where are we heading if I ask? My borrowed home. I washed with lights. The house was majestic. It reminded Faith of the house in which she was raped at 12 while hawking oranges for her mother. Both houses were white and imposing. They had similar giant Greek columns in the facade. Like cathedrals, they loomed over other houses and had broad lawns and flower birds around them. Like the mansion where she was robbed of her innocence, Faith's paradise brought to her mind the palace where Nebuchadnezzar flourished. As described by the midget Sunday school teacher in her parents' church, Eve's home was separated from the surrounding darkness by brilliant lights mounted on the stainless steel fence. The gate was opened by an armed soldier. Eve drove through an array of lights towards a mansion that created a feeling in faith that she was shrinking as she got nearer. This lady is covier, more beautiful, and far richer than the peddlers say. Faith said to herself, Is this the lady some gossip say is a prostitute? There were so many questions buzzing around in her brain, the most recurrent of which was, Am I awake? Or have I gone mad with sorrow? Faith knew from her psychiatric course that solitude and sorrow could create solace out of fantasy and lend reality to figments of the mind. She comforted herself that such a mental condition would not permit self-questioning. Eve drove right up the inclined floor to the massive white door. A pretty lady in immaculate white uniform and white boots opened the door into a world of opulence and splendor. Face of the bitter knot, she froze in the doorway. The last time she walked into this kind of expansive home, she was raped by an old man. She wanted to move in. It was so beautiful and enthralling. But her feet felt planted like milestones. Eve pulled her into the living room. It was large enough to play lawn tennis in. Dazzling white, golden lights, mirrors, silver, stainless steel, ceramics, and artworks. She's my sister. Her name is Faith. Prepare a room for her and food for us. Bring out my best wine. Eve told the lady in white uniform, Ida, 
was crested on her dress. You are welcome, ma'am, Idara said with a ready-made smile. Where's boyfriend? Eve asked. Just then, a massive white dog came bounding down from the stairs. I want to urinate, Faith heard herself saying. It's urgent. Oh, boyfriend, stay out of sight, okay? Eve hugged and kissed the panting dog and it left. Faith's briefs were wet when she pulled them down for relief. She took her time in the spotless toilet to digest the rather sudden change in her timeline. Eve of the countless fabulous tales in the flesh. And that massive dog must be the one reported to have growled in her one common room. Everyone was said to have evaporated, even the steroid prone lion hearts on campus flew through the windows. How many of those tales are true? Is Eve a prostitute? Is it remotely possible to derive this kind of luxury from sleeping around? The intercom in the toilet ran. Faith hesitated before lifting the handset. Are you giving birth to a baby in there? Eve asked. I'm out in a minute. What happened at the door? You looked like you saw a ghost in my home. I was raped in a house that looked like this. How old are you? I was 12. Oh dear, I too was raped. At age nine, so many unpunished rapists out there. Millions of silenced victims living in trauma. So sad. Justice for women will not come without a fight led by women. Our meeting out here is gaining traction. What do you mean? We'll talk when you are through in there. The talk took a long time to come. Faith never saw the dog again that night. Nor did she hear any growling or barking, but it loomed like a shadow over her anyway. She could not get the fangs and the chunky tongue out of her mind. How could a creature be so huge and scary? But dazzling white and cute at the same time. She could not relax in the house and could no longer hide the fact. Madam, Faith began. She was interrupted by Eve. Don't call me that. I'm sorry. Boyfriend is not going to charge down nor bother you again, okay? Glad to hear that. He's more of a gentleman than most men I know, though. Really? Just what kind of men have you been meeting? Eve gazed with those large, pristine eyes of hers. Even as a woman, Faith could feel the enthralling appeal. Her mother once told her a story of a mummy water who was so beautiful that no storyteller could conjure her face well enough. Faith saw Eve's face as equal to that mermaid's. Her tall, graceful frame, her sensational curves, her suppleness, her poise and peerless elegance, her mental prowess, her affluence, 
an incredible dog, and everything about her created an air of irresistible magic around her. Faith thought of her boyfriend Ibadan and shuddered. I wouldn't like Ibadan to run into this woman. No way, she said to herself. Let me shock you a little, she heard Eve say. I am a prostitute. Faith opened her mouth to say something, but could not utter a sound. I have had more men than King Solomon's wives and concubines. Certainly more men than you. So trust me when I say boyfriend is more of a gentleman than most men. Why do you call your dog your boyfriend, please? The whole statement about a thousand men was still processing in a puzzling manner in her brain. But the dog issue needed to be out of the way. Eve laughed. Sweet sounding waterfall of excitement with her head thrown back to show her perfectly sculpted neck. She sounded happy. Faith sorrow read its head again. Her hand raised up but was too late to stop a teardrop running down to her lips. Salty taste, she observed as she bit her lower lip. Did you expect it to taste bitter? She asked herself. And a smile came through. That's better, honey. Eve was delighted. Boyfriend is just a name. That's the name that popped out the first day I saw the dog and has stuck ever since. He gets to sleep with me often. He is the only gentleman I know that comports himself when in bed with me. Neither trembling nor fumbling. Boyfriend wears dignity without owning more than five colors. There are many men who claim to own the stars in the sky. They lose air readily if you refuse to inflate their egos for a split second. It keeps me warm, but when he gets an urge, he gets off to a chair and would watch me all night. He returns only when he is cooled off. SKD calls him Uriah the Hittite. Can you think of many gentlemen you know that can match that standard? That beast, she thought. Yes, that beautiful beast, Eve answered. Faith thought about her doting boyfriend, Ibadan. Can he stay in bed with me for an hour and remain faithful to you? Who are we talking about, please? Faith asked in alarm. You were thinking about your boyfriend, weren't you? Are you listening to my thoughts? Your eyes and your face mirror your thoughts clearly, honey. You don't need that. A woman needs mysteries around her. Be careful not to ascribe reasoning to dogs. A man was rushed to a teaching hospital during my clinical posting in 300 level. His so-called well-trained dog had beaten his genitals. Faith said after another quiet moment. Eve smiled. A man threw his wife from the fifth floor. She was lucky to grab the banister. He brought out a hammer and clobbered her fingers until she fell. For real? It was in the papers. Honey, when it comes to wickedness, men 
-hmm. not dogs gets the trophy. Anyway, my dog is not my boyfriend. That's just his name. I love him though. He is a rare gentleman trapped in the body of a beautiful dog. Cute, isn't it? And scary. I heard it charged into hall one and all the troublemakers took off. Like I said before, forget all the myths about me if you appreciate. Is this particular story true? Please. He is loyal to me and very protective. Now I need a swim. There's a jacuzzi if you can't swim. Of course I can swim. My mother is his own. So you have a swimming pool in this house? Faith was amazed. I borrowed this house from SKD. I prefer smaller but tasteful footprints when I buy a house. And I do have pools and jacuzzis in all my houses. Tamara! Faith exclaimed, houses? Nine houses in choice destinations around the world. I was 16 when I got my first house. My fake virginity was auctioned among nine generals. SKD won by placing the house in London on the table. He won hands down. That blew my mind, dear man. He would rather die than lose. That guy goes that incredible extra mile to win. By any means, he feels like a god. SKD created the myth that Eve of the Golden Anklet is only meat for immortal men. My most recent house is a dream come true. And you got all that from sleeping with men? You want me to believe that? Eve's spells of silence had a way of making you stay at her exquisite details. Smooth skin, luxuriant hair, inviting lips, her perfect fingers. Her aura holds you captive, especially when she keeps her voice away from your ears. The courtyard had a magnificent pool with lights around and inside it. There was indeed a jacuzzi near the bar at the other end of the pool and a brass statue of a man urinating into the pool. Music seeps from tiny speakers deployed everywhere. I had this pool and the Buddha modified to my taste at Eskidi's expense, of course. His pocket is as deep and as broad as the ocean. What does he do for a living? That's a complicated question. Let's just say he's one of those who set up the military era. They wired the system around their personal networks, rigged it so that the bloodstream of the nation irrigates their networks. I don't understand these networks myself. They are shrouded in secrecy. But millions of people are connected and most of them don't even know where the capital is flowing to or coming from. Like colonies of ants and all the queens owe untraceable allegiance to SKD. Influence merchant and investor. Yes, let's settle for that. Faith had never seen this level of luxury before, not even in her dream. Eve shrugged her shoulders in a practiced manner 
and her silky kimono slipped off her body. She had only her anklets on. How are these hanging up without braziers? Faith wondered. She looks like a goddess. He dived into the pool and stayed submerged for a rather long time. Fifth took off her dress and came nearer the pool where the lights were so bright. She saw Eve swimming across like a goldfish in an aquarium under the water for anxious minutes as if she had jewels inside her. As a student of medicine, she had her fears, but Eve swam slowly and gracefully to the end of the pool where the bar was located. She climbed out and Idera seemed to materialize again, this time with two glasses and a bottle of wine on a silver tray. What's going on here? Faith exclaimed. She was no longer in the mood for swimming. Wine? Eve asked. No way. This is special. From my vineyard in Cyprus. I'm feeling like a drunk already. This has been an incredible day. My mother woke me up early this morning to discuss my new role as the head of our home. She was telling me what I already realized, but saying it made me sad. Coming to campus today for the first time since I lost my father was so disturbing. I went out there to sob, away from everyone, especially my boyfriend. It is obvious to me that I need to sacrifice my virtue for my family and my education. Have a sip, honey. Last time I had a drink, it made me feel guilty when I was only a victim. You can't enjoy life if you have too many ghosts from your past haunting you. Let them go. Let them go. How come you were packed out there in the wilderness anyway? I was not packed. I was celebrating. I needed to be far from the crowd. I flew in from Paris last night. I went to sign the deed of a place along the bank of the Seine. A lovely house with a beautiful view. I plan to spend my old age there. You are that rich. I spend other people's money. What people don't appreciate is that a head of state neither cooks nor dips his hands into the big pot. Every new king therefore brews his own cronies, grooms his own crooks in the kitchen. We give them a road map. My procurer is the grand master of corruption. Chief is a technician who knows where the pending jobs are in the land. I mean mega deals. He knows the directors, the managers and executives involved. Very detailed dossier. Chief packaged the deal that transformed the status of one of the new thieves, a novice who never tasted power before. The guy was still wondering where the pipelines in his office were when Chief dropped the package on his lap. At a dedicated party. A typical mind-blowing leap that makes chief relevant from government to government. I presented the deal on chief's behalf and helped the guy move the money into untraceable accounts in America 
Europe, Middle East, and Asia. I secured my retirement place in Paris from my court. Well, not that straight court. It was a cocktail of deals that entailed buying six rows their first foreign assets and splitting the cost of mine among them. I drove out there to celebrate the acquisition. Celebrate? In that lonely wilderness? One of my quirks. Dark, abandoned places remind me of where I came from, so I don't get complacent. I saw you when I was speeding towards the river. A speeding car with full lights swept past you, and you obviously did not notice. When I was coming back, you were still very lost in your sorrow. To my surprise, I could not just speed away. I waited until you saw me and so on. I think this is silly, but if you are so rich, why are you in school? And why Liberty University? Why not simply employ lawyers? <laughs> Employing a thousand lawyers will not make me a lawyer. It was my father's last wish that I should be a barrister. Also, my first step towards rewriting my own history. And Liberty University is slightly off the radar for junk journalists. It is away from Lagos, Port Harcourt, and Kaduna, where I am too well known to achieve this goal. You could have schooled in Europe or America. Four years away from my gold mines? Are you kidding? You have gold mines? Men in power, honey. They are my gold mines. No place on earth quite like our country. They are men here with uncensored access to the national treasury. You can't be more generous than a man who is dishing out boundless booty. Booty for body, you know. Do you attend lectures? I have met the minimum requirements for attendance so far. I sometimes pay for lecturers by phone. I flew back from Paris to make sure I catch my lectures tomorrow. What a life! I have never dreamt of this kind of life. When you said you were a prostitute, I thought you were pulling my legs. After law school, I will be a barrister, and it could be actionable to call me a prostitute. But right now, despite my wealth, the men load their artilleries when they come to me. They know I am a prostitute. I encourage them to see me as one. It sets them free, you see. Inflames them. I like the tag because they obviously prefer slots to their wives. I have been quite fortunate with genetics and a visionary procurer like Chief. I have made a fortune. Fame and all that myth came from the company I keep. Making a fortune from male rascality requires a smart brain behind a beautiful face and a legit insider like Chief as my pin. I have made much more from influence trading, fundraising, money laundering than from parting my limbs, millions from creating assets for big businesses, both legal and barely legal. All these doors will slam shut the day I stop being a honeypot. My ace 
is making my praise feel like predators. My leverage comes from chief. Chief who? Chief Frederick Aswani. Everyone calls him chief. Everyone. He taught me how to fish for bone-free fishes. Chief can make a hen lay eggs and hatch elephants. He is the best ally a beautiful woman and a man in power can have in a corrupt country. For instance, before the enactment decree 6 of 1976, the blueprint for the relocation of the federal capital from Lagos to Abuja, Chief acquired land in Abuja for peanuts. After the decree, we got contracts to build roads, houses, hospitals, and sold the contracts for cold money without lifting a finger. We sometimes got people in charge to sign documents claiming that roads that were never started have been completed and approved. Everyone gets his or her beat and smiles to the bank. Chief is a genius at designing treasury fraud and milking economies. Once you grab power, he throws one of his irresistible parties and leaves schemes on your table that even angels cannot let pass. Clever schemes that are foolproof and totally bone free. I have properties in Maitama, Asokoro, and other areas which Chief has predicted. We appreciate incredibly when the federal government eventually moves to Abuja. Money is flowing in that direction and we are right in on the flow. Chief knows the shape of things to come. He makes millions from these insights and disclosures. Before there was any clue that Naira would tumble from two dollars for one Naira, Chief called me one night to start buying up dollars. We bought any dollar inside. One dollar is now being sold for four Naira. Chief says that the four has only just begun. He is as patient as a vulture. There is a symbiosis between us that puts every major cow in this country at our reach for milking before the crowd comes charging in, moving millions of dollars around the world for rogue politicians is a bone-free fish. Buying houses for them in foreign cities has feathered my nest. Thieves are not so prudent with spending. A besotted thief doesn't care. But these are the sweet spot, honey. The story is only truly appreciated by those who have experienced it. Those of us who have sold our souls don't have access to the normal joys of life. Greed is our bliss. Anyway, when democracy fell again, it was time to evolve. With all the hounding going on, getting into school was expedient. It was a perfect time to remember my pledge to read law. Lawyers and journalists can't be pushed around casually. A law degree is also a rich soil to sow a senatorial ambition whenever we return to democracy. Think of it. I have made money. Honey, I have fame and I enjoy tremendous power by proxy. What next? You know, I was in bed with a minister when the coup happened. He had a chopper shot down just to impress me. It was a Saturday morning. Paul came through my phone He's doing a spy. He's on the radio, he's screamed. 
Bachelor's voice was on air. You are all living witnesses to the great economic predicament and uncertainty which an inept and corrupt leadership has imposed on our beloved country for the past four years. I am referring to the harsh, intolerable conditions under which we are now living. Blah, blah, blah. All cool plotters sound alike, and the masses respond with the same glee. The masses are easily appeased with scapegoats. Even my cook, who steals more and more of my stock as the months go by, was asking for mass execution. Same routine every time someone wants the throne for himself. Honorable was one of my truest magicians. He could make anything happen with a mere phone call. Suddenly, he was a wet chicken on a motorcycle, sweating and disguised. He abandoned his kaftan and borrowed my gardener's work clothes. That evening, I called SKD. By midnight, I was flown to this house to prepare for Liberty University. By morning, modification of the house had started. Four days after, I was enrolled. How's that possible? You didn't sit for the entry examination? Nothing is impossible for SKD. He has infinite favors to call in. I want power, honey. I have a plan. Law school followed by a diploma in journalism, if I have time. Activism, maybe a little charity here and there. With the right narratives and rhetorics in the media and my connections, I could make the Senate when the time comes. When the inevitable end to military rule comes, I want to be well positioned. Power comes from planning, preparing, and being ready at the right moment. And having a kingmaker like SKD in my corner. When I become senator or minister, I can rewrite my history. Like you have everything worked out, Faith said with a note of envy. Everything except old age. I dread the day when men will become reluctant to forsake all their responsibilities and, and travel thousands of miles just to impress me. Since I was 16, I have preyed on magicians among men, men who are willing to set world records of generosity for exceptional women, men who are capable of changing state policies at my insistence. I have been lucky with my personal assets and I have been ingenious with managing big games. Poor dears, they are such lonely people. And I have a wizard like Chief in my red corner. Chief has access to the corridors of power, no matter who is on the throne. A perfect symbiosis. He led me to the pinnacle of male domination. Where does he live? These are guys that don't spend 24 hours in any location except there's a deal on the owner. He's the owner of the most exclusive inner cycle club in Lagos and has his fingers in so many deals, guns, gambling, illegal crude oil bunkering, hotels, money laundering, construction. He even has a casino in Las Vegas. He spared no effort in training for the sublime job of getting into a man's brain and turning him into a willing gold mine with an obsession to be remembered as the most generous ever. My beauty and the secret things I know 
having reached me beyond my widest imagination. If you are now rich, why not ditch sex work? Let nobody fool you and don't deceive yourself, man. You can't leave prostitution. It leaves you. I don't believe that. Who's talking of belief? Trust me, honey. There are so many doors into a brothel, but not a single door leading out. It's about power. To have powerful men on your leash. To have them do things their wives would dread to ask of them. The same uncanny power. And there's no other bondage quite like power. Power is a golden cage. Very addictive. These are things of the mind only inmates can understand. Chief taught me these long ago. Moreover, as I've said before, all these doors will slam shut the very second I cease to be a honeypot. How did you meet him? That silence again. What goes on in her mind when she withdraws like that? Where did you get the pendant and chain around your neck? Eve asked. My boyfriend gave it to me. That is a fortune. Ancient handcrafted piece. Where did he get that? I think you are diverting my attention from the question I asked. Someone somewhere will be willing to slit your throat to get that neckwear from you. I just realized you like horror stories. Let's swim, Eve said, and that enticing body of hers was flying into the pool already. Faith dived in after her and tried to overtake Eve. Eve stayed underwater and appeared slow, but emerged at the other end of the swimming pool ahead of Faith. How do you do that? Do you have gills? Eve laughed. She sat on the top rung of the ladder. I like you. So far, I have made no friends. Chief Frederick Aswani is the nearest approximate. I respect Chief. I trust him and I have never cheated him. If he dies, there will be a gap in my business. That's the sum of what Chief is to me. Chief corrects me politely whenever I address him as my friend. Your procurer, my dear. No more, no less. Never forget facts in favor of fiction. It's toxic. He's right. That's impolite. That is cold and calculating. And that's Fredo. Take it or leave it. You could be my sister if you like. He volunteered. If I like. Are you kidding me? No one will believe I have met with the most elusive woman on campus and the most beautiful woman ever. I'm thrilled to pieces. Not a good idea to talk about us, okay? Sure. Promise? On my honor. I told myself when I saw you looking so broken-hearted that if your gloom was about money, I will wipe it off completely. First time such thoughts ever crossed my mind. I never give out money. Men fall over themselves to compete in my generosity games. Women keep away. I don't know how come I even noticed you out there in the dark. As you walked towards me, I got excited about being a dream maker for you. I can't bring back your dad, but I can give you a check tonight 
equivalent to his salaries for four years to cater for you and your kid brother for three years. Why would you do such a thing? To give me pleasure. Especially if you keep your side of the deal. Which is, Faith asked anxiously. You say nothing about this whole drama of meeting me. I don't want any distraction, especially now. Our story must be a secret between us. Are we good? Seriously, I have not talked about myself like this before. How do I explain paying bills to my mother? Faith asked. If you decide to sleep around like me, how will you explain paying the bills? Faith was quiet. I don't want you to sacrifice your virtue. Keep your boyfriend. Become a doctor and hold up your head. No mocky past to wrestle with. That will give me a smile, you know, an Oprah Winfrey sensation. Who's Oprah Winfrey? Please, Faith asked. Never mind. But frankly, it's the first time in my life that I have offered anyone anything. Even my story has been buried in my heart like forever. I never gave. I will enjoy fixing your blues if you never mention it to anyone. Do I have your lady's word on that? Now I know I'm dreaming. Come here. Faith slipped into the water and started to swim away. Eve dived in after her. A rematch. Faith looked back to check. Suddenly, she felt hands on her hips. And before she could work it out, Eve was holding her clothes. Eve planted a kiss on her lips. Faith was stunned. Her thoughts started to race again. The kiss reminded her of Joe Macho, the lesbian in her life before Ibadan came by. Eve was better. Life was a swill for a while. Pleasurable, all right, but it was not feeling right. Later at dinner, Faith enjoyed the most delicious meal she ever ate. That ghost of a steward, the girl Friday who seems to vanish and reappear on secret clues, Ida was a good cook. Faith had not eaten a cooked meal all day. Her family shared a tin of sardines, a loaf of bread and water for breakfast before she left home for the campus. That recollection made her feel guilty about the sumptuous dinner she just enjoyed. Are you a lesbian? Faith asked. That was my very first kiss with a woman since I graduated. Graduated? Explain to me. I was trained in the art of kissing by a woman called Dr. Brown. That makes you a lesbian? No way. That was role play. Very serious learning process. Lighting a fire. Stroking a fire and harvesting it was never meant to be a pleasure for me. That's confusing. You are the first woman I have been close to. Mostly women stay away from me. Why did you kiss me? Honestly, I don't know. Just an impulse I couldn't resist. Maybe because I'm not used to female company. Sorry about that. Will you resist the nest? I hope so. I can't afford any weakness. Did you enjoy it? I panicked. I don't understand. 
usually I'm a predictor. For me, sex is always a magical performance where I am the grand puppeteer. My every gestures, my charms, my peaks and valleys are controlled by images in my head and are designed for my purpose. I panicked when I felt pleasure I did not permit causing through my body. I had a girlfriend before I fell in love with a guy. You don't have to divulge anything. You head up her hand. You opened up to me. It's only fair. I stripped on my own volition. I don't want you to feel obliged. I am comfortable telling you everything about me. It's okay, as long as it's your choice. It's okay, as long as it's your choice.